All right. So last time, remember, we learned what uh, Laplace transform is. We saw this uh, transfer function idea. And I indicated that there would be one very important use case uh, for this idea. As I said, it is uh, it has been used for a very long time in control theory. So there will be entire textbooks just written in terms of Laplace transform transfer function stuff. But uh, there are also textbooks written in state space uh, formulations. So uh, that is not the reason why we study. The reason is, uh, for us at least, is to be able to use frequency response analysis and uh, especially border plot. That idea is um, quite, um, how should I put it, quite native to Laplace transform style mathematics. And we pretty much need it in order to be able to do it. So uh, here today we are going to learn what it is, why it is important, uh, why we need the uh, entire new branch of mathematics uh, introduced in the course just for that. Okay. So first of all, first of all, let us consider um, a system to which we put an input in the form of a sine wave, a sinusoidal input. Okay. All right. So what you can observe is that frequency response of a steady state uh, system. Um, Oh, sorry, frequency response of a linear system when uh, sinusoidal input is given is also a sinusoid. Okay. In fact, uh, let us uh, try to understand this a little bit better. So, uh, we call something a frequency response when it is a output of a system. Right, output of a system after enough time has passed for all the influences of the initial conditions to have died off. Right. So uh, if the system is stable, what you expect is that um, initial conditions, their influence is going to go away, it's going to fade. And the only thing that is going to remain is the influence of the input. That is going to be constant. Okay. Uh, by constant, I don't. I don't mean that the. In this context, I don't mean that the derivative is going to be zero. What I mean is that it is going to be uh, somehow, um, like in this case, when sinusoid is given as input, it's going to be a same sinusoid again and again and again. It's not going to change between periods of the sinusoid. Okay. Right. Uh, so the frequency response is output, steady state output, given a sinusoidal input. You know, given a sinusoidal input. This might uh, sound a little bit uh, strange, you know, it may sound unnatural. Uh, if you consider differential equations, maybe you feel like it is strange to uh, kind of like slice them like this, initial conditions, input, right? But consider a mechanical example. Let's say you have, um, what, what would be a good example? Let's say you would have a, um, a pendulum, okay? Simple example, pendulum. And there is someone trying to shake it, right? So you have a pendulum and someone is trying to shake it. And they shake it uh, with a pendulum, as in like with a big mass, massive, uh, like, um, something uh, attached to it, right? So someone is trying to shake it. As you can imagine when they start shaking it, it, it was like stationary. So they were trying to shake it and it was uh, kind of like gaining momentum, kind of like uh, how your swings gain momentum when you try to uh, start swinging. Swings is our, maybe is a good example, right? Of a pendulum. <laughs> so let's consider swings. So they started to gain momentum, okay? But at some point, uh, the amplitude stop, uh, stops increasing, 
And actually, at some point uh, when you, you know, 30 minutes later, you won't be able to tell if the initial position of the swing, so the pendulum was a uh, rest, or if it was like pulled back a little bit. You can't say, because um, the influence of initial conditions had already been uh, dispensed with. The only influence that uh, is uh, defining how the swings behave is the magnitude and frequency uh, of the input uh, input signal, right? Input signal. So that is an example. Uh, for another example, maybe uh, sorry, I don't know how how to achieve this. Imagine if you sit on the car and you try to like jump up and down, for example, right? If the car has a good suspension, it's going to kind of go up and down a little bit, right? Again, uh, this initially what you're going like like first couple jumps, it's going to depend on like you know initial conditions, probably at rest. So it's going to like do something. But after a while, it's going to just go up and down, up and down, up and down at some uh, given frequency, some given amplitude. What I wanted to say with those two examples is. It is perfectly uh, reasonable to expect the um, how should I put it to expect the uh, output of the system after some time passed to not depend on initial conditions and stuff like this, only depend on the input. Physically, it uh, makes perfect sense. Mathematically, it makes perfect sense either. Also, so it's um, um, in both sense it is fine. The only problem here is that the terminology is maybe a little bit strange. Like we're talking steady state, but what we mean is um, frequency steady state. So we mean by that we just basically mean initial conditions had stopped playing a role. We don't mean a constant output. Okay, we'll spend enough time on this. Uh, hopefully you un you understood the story at uh, this point. If you have questions, uh, I'm happy to answer. Okay, so let's consider a system uh, of this type. So we have um, y equals g uh, times u, y equals g times u. Um, here, g is a system, right? Let's say, since it is written in this form, it is a transfer function. Input to the system is this, um, uh, Laplace space input u of s u of s, okay. and output is this Laplace space output y of s. Okay, so system has input, has output, has transfer function. All right. Now, if we have a sinusoidal input u of t equals to sine of uh, omega t, right. in time domain. This oh sorry in uh, uh, in Laplace domain this translates to the following it translates to omega divided by omega squared c squared where how did I get from sine omega t to omega divided by omega squared c squared well you remember Laplace transform by definition it is this uh, integral over Laplace kernel it was e to the power minus st and integral from zero to infinity over dt. Okay. Well, after integrating, we will get this. I'm not proving it, but uh, it is a standard uh, standard integral. Um, and I'm not sure if it is very difficult to prove it. So if you're interested, you can try to do it. It's uh, maybe a good exercise in integrating functions. Okay, so for now, we just believe me that this is a Laplace transform of a sine of omega t. So uh, given the sinusoidal input, the system becomes y of s, right, y of s, is equal to g of s, same g of s as here, times this whole thing, like omega divided by omega squared c squared. So this is what the system becomes after we substitute sinusoidal input. Okay. If you have any questions in, in, at any time, please interrupt me. 
Awesome. I will, for now, I will continue, but please stop me as soon as you have uh, something that's not clear. Oh, I have a question. Yeah, Excuse ahead. me, could you repeat, please, uh, what is GeoFS? GeoFS is a uh, uh, transfer function, uh, description of a system. So for just to be concrete, for example, if uh, you had a time uh, domain uh, OD, which was described as uh, divided T equals to, let's say, um, what would be a good? Would be a good way to describe. Let's say it was like uh, divided divided t times um, okay, four divided t uh, plus two y equal to u. Let's say you had this uh, od as your original function. Then uh, in Laplace domain, this becomes four s plus two. Uh, that is for for s is um, four times uh, uh, divided t, right? Two is you know from here. All this times y equal to u. Okay. From here, what we can do next is um, we can find what y is. And y is one over this uh, stuff in the bracket for s plus two uh, times u. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Uh, I see. Thank you. Yeah. So this one over s plus two is uh, g of s. Oh, uh, good question. Good question. Thank you. Okay. Now, let's say function g of s is a, a rational fraction. Rational fraction means basically that we can write it this way. What uh, do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is here we have denominator decomposed into a product of n brackets, okay? where in the brackets pi are roots of uh, the expression in the denominator of g of s. Right. So expression in the denominator of G of S is a polynomial, right? As you can imagine, G of S is a fraction. So there is a polynomial on top, polynomial on the bottom. It doesn't have to be, of course, a polynomial, but uh, let's assume that it is. For all our linear systems, it's going to be a polynomial. So, you know, assume that it is polynomial. Uh, if pi are roots of the polynomial, right, then uh, we can, assuming that p, uh, p of s is a rational fraction, we can uh, decompose it in this form. Right? In fact, those p are very important. They are called poles of the transfer function. They're called poles of the transfer function. Okay. It's quite interesting poles of the transfer function. Uh, our stability analysis before was based on eigenvalues. There is an equivalent uh, analysis based on poles. In fact, if, uh, you can find criteria for um, uh, what poles of the transfer function should be like in order for the whole thing to be Lyapunov stable. And uh, if you look Deeper and deeper into it, you will be able to prove relations with the eigenvalues and poles and so on. I, I'm not going to go into it uh, right now, but uh, is uh, they all uh, come from the same from the same stuff, right? Okay. So poles of the transfer function. Good. Now, um, yeah, if. Uh, pi are real and non-repeating, for example. So there are only there is only one uh, pole of you know of one value. Uh, we can decompose this expression into something like this. Okay. Yeah. 
you can see, <laughs> I, I, I'm all kind of dancing around this uh, fact, but you can see that the poles basically behave exactly the same as the eigenvalues. In fact, they're going to be the same. Okay. Uh, I, I'm just always uh, scared of making statements like this uh, without proofs and stuff. But uh, yeah, uh, they're the same as eigenvalues. And when I say PI are real and non-repeating, I'm basically making the same assumptions I made uh, when I was uh, starting to prove some stability properties on the lecture two, on the lecture two. So you can see even the assumptions are the same, like everything is very similar. But anyway, um, you can decompose this fraction into a sum of fractions. Uh, this might, on the, might look uh, like it should be possible on the first glance. It may look like, oh, we're, we're doing some tricks. Like it shouldn't be easy to decompose something like big into something small. But if you think about it, it when you want to decompose the right-hand side back into the left-hand side, like compose it if you want, right? What you're going to do is multiply this guy to here, to here. So it would have to go here. And here, right? You would multiply all those fractions by C plus P1 on uh, both on the numerator and denominator, right? What you're going to do next after that is you're going to multiply everything by C plus P2 on the numerator, on the denominator, on the numerator, on uh, denominator, right? And you're going to repeat the same for the next one, and the next one, the next one, and the next one, like this one too, right? Everything is going to be multiplied by it. What you're going to see after you finish multiplying everything is that your denominator would look exactly like the denominator here after you multiplied it uh, sufficiently, like by every, everything was multiplied by um, everything uh, that uh, is um, like, but Everything was multiplied by C plus P1, C plus P2, C plus P3, and so on. Denominator of the resulting fraction would always look the same as the denominator of the original one. Okay. You basically made sure it was. Now, numerator is going to be this enormously big expression, which would contain uh, polynomials of degree n minus 1, because you multiply them n minus 1 times. The only one that, for example, the first one would miss in the numerator is C plus P1, right? Everything else is going to be multiplied here and so on. So it will be a sum of, big sum of P uh, of uh, polynomials of the degree N minus one. And uh, we're going to be able to find such coefficients R that would make it exactly equivalent to N of C. Right? Okay. When we said uh, it was a rational fraction, it also implied that uh, this transformation was possible um, uh, because N of C would have correct uh, correct uh, number of um, uh, correct degree correct degree. If N of C was higher degree than this, basically it would mean that uh, the uh, whole transfer function is be best represented not as a fraction, but as a something multiplying a fraction. So like you can take the highest degree out of uh, of, uh, of the thing, right? I'm not sure, should I try to show it? Okay, we'll, 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 we'll skip it for now. But uh, yeah, the idea is that a N, N of C should be a sufficient uh, degree for this transformation to be possible. So for example, if the degree of denominator is three, degree of numerator can be one, like zero, one, two, something like this. Shouldn't be three. Um, yeah, uh, it shouldn't be three. If it is degree three, if you studied it, I don't know if in calculus you couldn't uh, divide basically it by uh, denominator, you would get a number out and the, you, after this uh, process, you would have a new polynomial in the numerator of degree two or something. Yeah. Okay. Oops. 
do we have questions about this part like about uh, going from here to here So we're not going to do it by hand in the course, so don't worry if it sounds a little bit mysterious. It's just to illustrate what we're doing. Okay. Now, uh, let's go back to our system G of S multiplied by omega divided by omega squared plus C squared. Right. Here, it is the same exact situation as before. It's just that uh, the numerator is now not n of s, but n of s times omega. The denominator is not this whole string uh, that we saw here, 1 plus p1, s plus p1, s plus p2, etc. But it is all of those multiplied by omega squared plus c squared. And omega squared plus c squared, if you uh, let, let me write it out here. So, uh, omega. Uh, Omega squared plus T squared can be rewritten as omega minus uh, plus S times omega minus S because S is a oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, made the made the uh, no mistake. Let me rewrite again. S minus J omega. Yeah, now it is correct. S plus J omega. Okay, now it's correct. Now it's correct. Um, so we can can rewrite this in uh, like this bracket in this expanded form. J in this case is a uh, imaginary number. So when you put it together, what you have is uh, this is a form of um, difference of squares, right? It should be S squared. Let me continue, I guess, uh, the expansion, just so you can see uh, how, how it uh, goes back together. It is the same as S squared minus, oh, let me, minus uh, J omega squared. But J, J omega squared is the same as um, uh, minus one uh, omega, right? G squared is minus one. So we go back to our original uh, situation. Okay. So basically denominator just added to, to itself uh, two more brackets. Bracket S minus G squared, uh, minus G omega and S plus G omega. Okay. So when we do the same expansion as we did before, we are going to have all of those same uh, guys here, and two are additional guys. This one and this one. Two additional guys. And uh, upstairs, we are also going to have the same R1, R2, etc., Rn. And uh, we are going to have uh, two additional ones, alpha and beta. Uh, those guys are not anything new. It is the same as uh, what we saw before. Uh, just we have a few more elements downstairs. So we'll have a few more additional um, simple fractions um, added, right? That's pretty much it. Okay, okay. Now uh, let us consider one of those fractions. So well, for example, Ri divided by C S plus Pi, right? One of those fractions. How does it behave? Well, let us uh, consider a transfer function. Y of S equals to, um, you know, uh, v of v of uh, w of uh, S times u of S. Okay. Let's consider this uh, where we would say that uh, W of S is this uh, guy, Ri divided by S plus Pi. Let us rewrite this transfer function back as an ODE. As an ODE, it would look like S plus uh, Pi minus Y, Y of S. Right? 
equals to u of s uh, times r i times r i. Okay, all right. Well, uh, this we can write now in time domain. In time domain, it would be dy, there's a question? Oh, no, okay, so uh, interrupt me please uh, if you have a question, don't wait for me to finish the derivation. Okay, dy dt uh, plus pi times y, Right. equal to ri uh, times uh, u of t. Okay, this is the same thing uh, in time domain. Same thing in time domain. Okay. All right. Now, I, I will, uh, so you, you you see that this basically represents, this basically represents the, um, as like a very simple OD. If we get rid of the, um, if we get rid of this uh, like right-hand side, we say, okay, let's let u of t be equal to zero, right? Let u of t be equal to zero. In fact, uh, yeah, why not? Then what we'll have is something like dy dt is equal to uh, minus pi uh, times y. Right? And you can see that this would be, uh, this would be uh, easy uh, equation which we can solve which would look something like this. The solution would look something like this. Right? Uh, there is a question of initial conditions, which we always uh, sort of drop when we talk about Laplace, uh, right? So, um, is, you know, let's, for now, for simplicity, ignore initial conditions, right? Like for some reason, I have a right here. But, uh, let's ignore it for now. Uh, the principal part, um, that we need to observe here is uh, that this guy clearly is going to go to towards zero, right? As time goes to infinity, this guy clearly is going to go towards zero. That is important. That is important. So uh, let me just point out connections that we made. So this original system was decomposed into those um, number of those uh, blocks, right? Each of those blocks behaves in a certain way, right? For example, this particular block behaves the same as this equation, which uh, has a solution, which dies to zero. And this is exactly what you're expecting it to behave, right? If it was stable, of course, it would be, uh, you know, exactly what you said, right? Table, right? It's going to die towards zero. Why not? So all of those blocks, and that is true not only for this block, right? It is true for this block, this block, but for all of those blocks until here, they're all going to die towards uh, towards uh, uh, infinity. So uh, that is a transient process they represent transient process. So the process that is uh, affecting the system, but uh, only initially, like after a while it uh, goes away. Okay, okay. So the only part that does not go away, the only part that uh, persists is this, is this part. It is this part that uh, persists. Uh, why uh, why does uh, this part persist? Well, um, one of the simpler ways is to just observe that uh, the eigenvalue of those transfer functions is omega j, omega j. So the solution corresponding to those 
uh, functions would look something like this. I'll try it here. It would be y of t is equal to in some constant. Uh, let me for now just uh, write as a constant times e to the power to the power minus j omega t. Mm -hmm. But e to the power minus j omega uh, t is actually actually um, if you, you probably studied this um, uh, studied this. Um, in one of your uh, classes, uh, this Euler formula, right? E to the power i, so where i is uh, imaginary one, right? Uh, imaginary unit um, is decomposed into the sum of sine and cosine. Right? So there will be some like two coefficients, cosine uh, omega t plus uh, less coefficient sine omega sine. Okay. So in fact, uh, the solution is going to behave like a sinusoid. Right? You can say that it is a sum of cosine and a sine, and this is true, but also sine of a cosine and a sine is uh, the same as a sinusoid uh, that is changed by um, the phase is changed a little bit, like it's the sinusoid is the shifted phase. We, we don't have to go into all of this, but uh, this ge geomet geometrically, this is how it looks like. Okay? This is a single sinusoidal wave. So in fact, what you are going to observe here is that only those red components produce uh, persistent output. Everything else dies down, only those two produce persistent output. That is what we would expect, right? They are the components that uh, correspond to the input uh, transfer function. So somehow it makes perfect sense that they produce persistent output. Okay. All right. Now, uh, let's go. Now, uh, what we can do is uh, we can show that um, those alpha and beta basically can be derived as uh, some kind of constant multiplied by uh, the transfer function, where the transfer function is evaluated for value g omega. So uh, let me remind you, the, the original system looks like this. Okay y of c equals to j of the y of s equals to j of x times u of s. Right? Now, what we do here is that we take this transfer function and substitute instead of s, g omega. Like g omega. Right? That's what we substitute, g omega. And this uh, produces for us, basically the expression for alpha when multiplied by some kind of constant here. Okay. I'm not going to go into proof here, but uh, yes, suffices to say that this, uh, if you want to prove it, you're basically just going to do a rational expansion, like a rational fraction expansion. You're going to see what uh, happens. Somehow you probably won't be surprised that uh, upstairs there you would see like mo uh, the whole original transfer function. Why would you see it there? Well, because uh, when you collect those things back together, the whole denominator of transfer function, original transfer function is going to be multiplied by alpha and beta, right? Then they're going to multiply each, their own denominators will multiply each other. You will have some kind of expression there. And from there, you from this you would get um, as expressions from uh, for them. Okay. All right. All right. Now, let's uh, believe that this is true. Right. Then, um, since alpha and beta 
depend on uh, transfer function at those uh, evaluated at uh, i omega j omega instead of uh, s. Basically, the behavior of the system can be analyzed by analyzing transfer function evaluated at uh, j omega. Right now, this uh, you know, since especially since we did it uh, without proofs and so on, this sounds a little bit shaky. And even if I showed you the proof that comes through all those fractional expansions, you'd believe me mathematically, but it won't uh, give you the feeling that you're doing something right. It would kind of feel like, oh, this is so strange, right? It's like we went around, 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 and we went uh, somewhere. Uh, just doesn't seem doesn't seem um, plausible, right? So let's uh, get some intuition before we continue. Let's get some intuition. So first of all, let's uh, get some intuition about Laplace transform. We already said a few things about it, but uh, I think it bears repeating. So Fourier series, I don't know if you remember them. It is basically a series where you multiply cosines and sines with coefficients, discrete number of times, like you have uh, inf infinite number of times, but discrete uh, discrete uh, elements of, uh, of their discrete elements of this uh, series, right? Okay. So Fourier series, um, it, uh, that is a way to represent a periodic function, periodic function, right? As a sum of harmonics. So those harmonics, uh, can be thought of as forming a basis in a linear space. It is an infinitely large basis, but it is a basis. Okay. So coefficients of a Fourier series can be thought of as a discrete spectrum of the function. So um, you have a spectrum, but it is basically a vector with infinitely many components. It's not a graph, it's just a um, a series of numbers. Okay. Alternatively, Fourier transform can be thought of as giving a continuous spectrum. So it is still a basis in terms of harmonic functions, but now it is continuous. It's not discrete. Discrete basis we can somehow imagine, right? It's like coordinates, but in the infinite uh, infinite dimensional space. So we have Coordinates and coordinates and coordinates, they, you don't run out. That is the situation. With the Fourier transform, somehow you don't even have coordinates. Like it's just a graph, basically, right? Spectrum. Okay. So Laplace transform, you can think of, of it in the same way, uh, but um, it is a continuous spectrum, except the basis, basis is different. The basis is given by complex exponentials. So uh, basically, there's the solutions to second order ODEs. Right? So for Laplace transform, it was sines and cosines. So solutions to ODEs, where uh, the, where the um, a real part of the eigenvalue is zero. So solution doesn't die off. Here, it is a solution to general. Um, general OD where, uh, but usually stable, yes. right? Uh, where the solutions can die off at different frequencies, different uh, sorry, uh, rates. Okay, so Laplace, you can think of it as a generalization over Fourier. All right. All right. Now, let's look at Fourier transform. Fourier transform looks like this right? integral from minus infinity to plus infinity over a function that you transform. Here's a Fourier kernel, that is e to the power minus two pi j t omega dt. Okay. Now let's look at uh, Laplace transform, integral from zero to infinity over our function, exact same. And now the kernel is e to the power minus st dt. 
Now, like two pi, let's let's just ignore this. Like uh, the part two pi in in here, that just has to do with uh, how we prefer to scale the coefficients. Yeah. What's j what is interesting is j t omega. Well, remember that s this uh, variable s is basically can be thought of as alpha uh, plus uh, j omega uh, for for Fourier transform. I'm oh, sorry, for Laplace transform, where alpha is a real part of the eigenvalue. J omega is a complex number part of the eigenvalue. So you can th see that uh, both, both look very similar, except Laplace has a real part of the eigenvalue, and Fourier doesn't. That is the situation. OK. Now, if we analyze solutions to linear Ds, uh, we know that uh, if so, um, if we have harmonic input, right, like sine, cosine, etc., then as we said today, after the transient process is over, right, the solution approaches a harmonic with the same frequency. We can prove it just by uh, trying to solve an OD with the input that is called non-homogeneous OD. I'm not sure if it is a part of your program, uh, so I'm a little bit uh, worried about if I can pull on this knowledge. But basically, it is a standard derivation, uh, right? Uh, same as if you study linear ODs, you usually have a part of the course where you discuss how to find uh, those constant coefficients, c1, c2, c3, uh, that uh, appears in the solution, right? You say that solution depends on the roots of the characteristic polynomial. That is uh, standard stuff, right? If so I notice connection with what, with what we are doing, uh, roots characteristic polynomial, uh, you know, poles of transfer function, something sounds familiar. So uh, the solution depends on the roots of characteristic polynomial, right? That's what you usually see. And you will spend time understanding how to find C1, C2 from initial conditions. OK. They usually uh, would be a separate part of the course, but maybe you didn't have it, where you'd say, what about right-hand side input, which would be a sinusoidal, general sinusoidal input? And uh, basically, from that, you find what we call particular solution to OD, particular solution to an OD. And uh, the rules of finding uh, those um, coefficients for particular solution are exactly the same. There is uh, no difference, no difference. So uh, they, it's quite uh, quite simple. And the frequency remains the same. So frequency associated with uh, particular solution is the frequency of the input. OK. But amplitude and phase can be different. That is, I think. Amplitude and phase can be different. OK. So intuitively, intuitively, we can think of imaginary part of S as having to do with frequency response, right? OK. So we can think of what well, exists Laplace variable. Imaginary part, we can think of it as <coughs> somehow representing uh, frequency response. If, uh, if I can pull back on analog with Fourier, Notice that imaginary part of this transform is the same as Fourier transform. So it gives us a spectrum of, uh, of a function. So it has, has to do with frequencies. A real part has to do with uh, attenuation, like how fast it goes to zero. OK. So if we have a kernel of a Laplace transform as e to the power minus st, right, where s is sigma plus j omega, and putting omega to 0, we get the kernel e to the power j omega t equal to cosine omega t minus j sine omega t. 
And this, as you can see, is uh, similar to Fourier transform Kaplan. Okay. okay. All right. So when I said, uh, just one second, we'll go back here. When I said that uh, here alpha and beta depends on evaluating transfer function at j omega, j omega, basically you can think of it as uh, reminding you that uh, this would be the same as going from Laplace to Fourier yeah, somehow, right? That's, uh, that's the idea. And the reason uh, that the, any of this makes sense is because uh, for ODEs, you can uh, see solution to a system with a input, a, a harmonic input, as a harmonic function with the same frequency, but different phase and amplitude. Mm -hmm. So frequency here would stay the same. Uh, omega here is a frequency. But the amplitude and phase would be different. OK, like alpha beta will de define your amplitude and phase. All right, all right. Now, border plot, border plot. Like uh, all of this was a uh, big, big discussion. Uh, now we need to have a payoff. So the key idea of a border plot is to um, find like those alpha and beta from which um, we would be able to understand how a system reacts to the input uh, harmonic. Okay. So we take our transfer function. We replace this uh, S equal to sigma plus I omega with uh, sigma equal to zero. Mm -hmm. So our transfer function becomes a transfer function of J omega. Okay. Then we plot amplitude of this transfer function as given by absolute value of this complex number. Amplitude is the absolute value of complex number. Okay. And phase of this transfer function. Phase of this transfer function. That is uh, our tangents, uh, I mean, like, <laughs> how should I put it? I've right here how you would in practice do it, but let me just uh, before before I make you um, scared, let me just remind you what it actually means. So here is a complex plane. Here is a complex number. What is the uh, absolute value of this complex number? Oh, it is its length. Length that is all the just is just length of this complex number. Okay, what is its phase of this complex number? Or what is the this angle? Yes. <laughs> it's not so complicated. It's not so complicated. Uh, but of course, when you write it all out like this, it looks complicated, right? But basically, it's uh, our tangents. Uh, here is just absolute value. Okay. All right. Now there is a tradition. There is a tradition of how to plot a uh, border plot. Uh, you plot two different plots. One of them is twenty logarithms of the absolute value of uh, this transfer function. Okay, looks strange. All right. Second one, eighty one eighty over pi times the phase of the transfer function. So you can reasonably ask me why do we need 20 here? <laughs> Logarithm, you can probably understand that uh, this is in order to uh, for the graph not to go out of the charts, right? Uh, logarithmic scale makes perfect sense. Okay. But why 20? Can someone answer me, uh, good, give a good guess why 20? This is just like general knowledge question. It's, uh... Decibels, decibels, yes, yes, decibels. Do you know why decibels uh, require 20, not like 30 or something? Uh, well, uh, 
it should uh, it should re require magnitude of 10 and not to why it scaled by two mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. some yeah it's very good very good this so uh, this in decibels deci is uh, 10 so yeah that's why 10. uh in fact decibels have a two here because uh, they uh, what they want to work with is sometimes energy which is uh, like has a square somewhere in the brackets and sometimes the signal itself so this uh, two in uh, like 10 in the 20 is from decibels being decibels not like bells right and uh two is uh, has to do with the fact that the people who developed this in the bell lab wanted to work with energies uh, and, and signals sometimes so it's like um uh, energy is a square of the signal so that's that's pretty much that's where the two comes from yeah oh there was an answer here sorry i was uh next time i'll try to hide it <laughs> okay my apologies sometimes i ask questions and then i give uh give some of it on the slide yeah you are right uh, it's uh yeah that, that's how it is good good now let's look into it a little bit more so consider a very simple transfer function one over one plus s uh this as you can imagine corresponds to differential equation um dy dt equal to uh, minus y How did I do this transformation? Well, uh, what I was where I read it is downstairs, what you have is y plus dy dt, right? It's going to be here. And the input is going to be on the right. I, uh, strictly speaking, what I said isn't true. Strictly speaking, it's going to be plus input. Right? But uh, in the absence of input, it's going to be that. Okay. All right. Okay. Now let us uh, evaluate it at j omega. So what we get is instead of uh, what we had, now uh, we have instead of s uh, j omega. Mm -hmm. Now we can multiply both sides. Uh, both denominator and numerator by one minus j omega and then in the denominator what we would have is one plus omega squared right it's a uh, one squared minus j omega squared equals to omega squared with the minus sign right so minus minus gives plus so that's how we give it again the reason we do this step uh the step here is uh to make sure that the denominator is a real number very useful for uh everything okay so a real part of this uh transfer function is one plus uh one divided by one plus omega squared oh so this guy this is a real part of the of the transfer function imaginary part of the transfer function is minus omega divided by one plus omega squared so is this 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 that is our imaginary part okay now a uh, border plot uh, would be uh, to plot it we need amplitude and phase so amplitude how do we compute it oh very simple we amplitude is absolute value of the uh, transfer function evaluated at j omega so it is one squared plus omega squared right that's how we compute absolute value we uh, uh, take real part squared plus imaginary part squared square root so it'd be one squared plus omega squared divided by one plus omega squared times one plus omega squared right so 
plus all this divided by denominator squared. Okay. And notice that uh, denominator and numerator are kind of the same, right? Except uh, one is uh, has a power of a bigger degree, like so. One plus omega squared goes away. Well, and what we have is uh, at the end of the day, one divided by square root of one plus omega squared. Okay. If you're going to take a log of this function, it's maybe even look pretty, but uh, well, I'm not going to do it by hand. But uh, yeah, this, uh, this is the result. Okay, let us now do the same, but with the uh, uh, face. With the face, I will just write it out. Like we have minus imaginary part here. Sorry, imaginary part is a minus. Maybe. And we have a real part here. And uh, we evaluate it as a uh, quadrant uh, tangent. Right? Uh, quadrant tangent is something that you are almost definitely familiar with, right? If you're not, just think of it as R tangent, uh, but uh, yeah, like with this being first being y and second being x. You know? Uh, if for, for, to go to a tangent, I think you would need to replace the comma with a division sign, but I, I don't want to do it with a, like a, on the fly like this. So my apologies, I'm not going to. Yeah, a tangent basically it says um, just in case I would uh, I would explain how it works. I, I suspect that you already know. Okay, so here let's say this brown thing is a vector. And you want to evaluate its angle. Basically, what you uh, when you say at a tangent two, you are saying, okay, I will give you as input first the height of this vector, so the projection onto the vertical axis, and then uh, horizontal uh, length of the vector, so projection onto the horizontal axis, compute me the angle here. That is uh, how the function works. And uh, the reason we like our tangent two instead of our tangent is because uh, it works on every quadrant. There is no issues with sign or anything like that. In every quadrant, it would work fine and give you correct uh, correct uh, angle. Okay, all right. Any questions so far? Okay, so uh, this is how we can compute those two values, right? But of course, you can imagine that in uh, software, you can compute uh, this for anything because uh, the transfer function is going to be just a, uh, like given omega, substituting some omega, you would be able to turn transfer function into a scalar, complex valued scalar. And computing absolute value and uh, phase of a scalar is a, you know, it's not even the work. All right, all right. Now, before we discuss how to use it, uh, let us uh, remind ourselves of one last uh, thing from the previous lecture. We ended uh, with discussing the topic of closed loop systems. Yeah. And we said that the, with a simple, with the feedback, we can close loop, close the system, and uh, we will get some kind of form like this. Except there, I used the general controller. Here, I instead of controller, I so like I consider that the control is equal to one. Okay, so we had H um, on the uh, yesterday, right? Controller. Now I don't have H here, so I replaced it with one. Okay. All right. Now, for this closed loop system, we can uh, substitute here the same uh, replacement from S to J omega. And we get a function of frequency, which would be J of 
g of j omega divided by one plus g of j omega. Okay. Now let us notice that this function behaves badly at a very specific point. And that point is when denominator turns to zero. So when j, g of j omega is equal to minus one. Okay. So if uh, g of j omega is equal to minus one, the fraction goes towards infinity. Like as it approaches this value, the fraction approaches infinity. Uh, uh, plus or minus infinity depends on the uh, from which side we approach this uh, number. Right? So this this is not good. This is not good, clearly not uh, desirable. Okay. So we want to avoid two things. Uh, we want to avoid two things. One thing we want to avoid is g of uh, j omega being uh, equal to one in uh, amplitude, right? We don't want it to be uh, length of one. That is, uh, like, in general, it is okay, but, uh, you know, if it actually manages to be minus one, not just one, but minus one, right? It's going to be a problem. So amplitude one is a warning for us, right? Amplitude one is a warning for us. Second is uh, the phase. The phase should not be equal to my, uh, 180, right? Because uh, let, let us understand this. Um, for a uh, complex number, this is a phase zero. This is a phase 90. This is a play phase 180, right? So negative numbers have pure, purely real negative numbers have phase 180. So uh, by, the, by themselves, those two properties are fine. Like we don't have any problem with. Um, Amplitude being equal to one if the phase is not equal to 180. And same, we don't mind phase being equal to 180 if the amplitude is not one. But if they are simultaneously true, phase 180, amplitude one, we're in big trouble. Okay. So that is the insight that we need to have. Okay. Now, uh, let's uh, I'll open the website. I will see uh, example. I really like it, so I will just uh, you know we'll, we'll just look into what uh, this guys um, what this guys uh, did. Yeah. By the way, here is a, we are going to go here, but uh, at the end of the lecture there is also this code example. You can use it uh, if you want. You know, it's, uh, it's a Python code just to see how border border plot can be plotted. If I can click, I don't know why I cannot. Let me try to do something. One second. All right. So let us look at body plot uh, and to understand how we analyze it. So uh, the way the way we analyze uh, body plot is something like this, something like this. Let me just make sure I share the correct screen. Yes. Okay. So first of all, we need to um, uh, plot separately magnitude right, in decibels and phase. Phase we plot in uh, degrees, but that is just a tradition. But yeah, you would probably want to do the same. Okay. Now let's look at um, this part of the graph. So it stays at 20 decibels. So we are quite happy here. We are quite happy here. Now it slowly goes from 20 decibels towards zero and then from zero to minus 20. Okay. At this point, it is zero decibels. Zero decibels means uh, a length one. Basically, you can think of it as a, what is the logarithm of uh, one to zero, okay. to which uh, power do you need to raise a number 
for it to become one to the zero power power. Okay. Okay. Now uh, uh, this point is uh, what we call gain crossover frequency. I, I think my uh, I need something brighter. Okay. Gain crossover frequency here. That is a point uh, where we have this one of those warnings. Remember I was talking about it. Like we're fine with it, but we need to make sure that the frequency at this point is not minus one eight. Sorry, no, it's not one one eight. Like we're fine with uh, having uh, length of one, but the frequency has to behave. So let's look what frequency does at this very point. Well, at this point, the frequency is equal to um, uh, the frequency is equal to uh, one eighty nine, I believe. 189 minus 189 uh, to precise one is 189 okay so it uh, didn't uh, cross this uh, point of um, didn't cross this point of um, 180 like it's, it's not at the point 180 so we have a margin that's what we call a margin right Um, of nine degrees. So if we change the system and this change affects the phase of the system, what's going to happen is we have nine degrees of leeway. We can in, uh, decrease this like frequency, uh, sorry, frequency, what, what, what I'm saying. We can decrease phase by nine degrees and, and uh, then we will become unstable. Nine degrees is not a huge margin, but it is something. Okay. Now uh, let us look at the frequency graph. So frequency starts somewhere here below uh, above one eighty. Now it goes down, 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 and here it crosses one eighty. So here is another warning, right? At this point, we are fine as long as the amplitude is not zero. Like is not one, but uh, on the decibel graph, it's going to be zero. So let's look up. And what we see is that at this point, our amplitude is actually 20 decibels. So we have a 20 decibel margin. So it means that we can, for example, decrease the uh, um, uh, amplitude of the transfer function by 20 decibels, and it would still be fine. Right, so only 20 decibels, like 19 decibels would be fine. 20 decibels would make the gas unstable. So that is the way people analyze it. If you are interested in, uh, like to me, to be honest, like when I first saw it, it always sounded like this is so artificial, like, you know, this it sounds like so such a special case. It is, uh, maybe it is an artificial special case, like, I don't know, but uh, it, it is very useful because it is one instrument to analyze frequency response. And in practice, usually what you care about is frequency response. Your initial conditions often can be controlled quite well, but uh, input signals are quite another matter, quite another matter. So uh, extremely, extremely useful. But also, also, the artific artificiality of what we have did here, like this analyzing those margins and so on, has to do with the fact that this is uh, optimized for humans, right? And, uh, you know, we, we should be thankful for that because during class, it, it is nice to use things that are optimized for humans. <laughs> but you don't have to, you don't have to optimize stuff for humans. So uh, what you could do is, for example, uh, instead of analyzing those uh, crossover uh, frequencies, those um, phase margins and so on, right? Instead of all of this, you could just say, okay, how can we simultaneously change um, this transfer function in terms of gain amplitude to reach this 
know, the point of instability, right? To reach the point of instability. How can we do this? And uh, then uh, you can uh, basically find the shortest distance towards this point of instability, right? You can say, okay, if we change the function in this direction, like it's going to be, like in terms of this parameter, it's going to be very quickly crossing this boundary. Right? And uh, uh, then you would be much more precise than saying, okay, if the phase change, but amplitude somehow stays the same, then something happens. If uh, amplitude stays the same, but phase changes, then this happens. You can uh, change them at the same time. It's just not going to be graphically as obvious. But since you work on the computer most of the time, you, like analyzing it in terms of um, you know code is uh, should be easy enough. Should be easy enough. And in, in fact, you can look at other plots, such as like Nyquist plot, which uh, would give you much more uh, of a, I think, uh, comprehensive picture of this stuff. Uh, we're not going to cover it in the course. I just want to point out that what I showed you today was not the full extent of the toolbox that you can have. It was just the introduction of how you can analyze frequencies. It is sufficient. It is uh, uh, difficult enough already. So we're not going to go beyond beyond it. Right? But you, you can. And uh, there's plenty of material on the internet and uh, in textbooks. Uh, there is no limit uh, in terms of um, like practical abilities of these functions here. Like this is just introductory and an introductory level. For practical applications, you'll be able to go for uh, further. But even so, even on this uh, like introductory level, you can see that it is uh, useful. It already allows you to answer questions such as: Will my system actually behave well? given the whole range of frequency inputs. In fact, let me just for a second uh, like discuss this point. Imagine that you know your frequency, frequency of your input. Let's say you know that the frequency is right here. That is your input frequency. You know that uh, you're going to experience this type of like frequency uh, kind of like bumping you around. Okay. You can say, OK, at this frequency, my um, transfer function is going to attenuate at minus 20 decibels. Okay, sounds very good. And you can say uh, the phase is going to be this. No, uh, quite, quite uh, away from instability. And uh, we can even say that the magnitude of the input is going to be greatly decreased, right? Because the, uh, because of the magnitude here is in minus decibels, so it's going to attenuate, right? Good. On the other hand, you can say, oh, what if the frequency is very small, like it is here? Oh, you can say, well, it's going to be 20 decibels, not minus 20, 20, you know? It's uh, useful to analyze those kind of things. Uh, it's useful to analyze them. Stability is great, but you also want to be able to uh, analyze how exactly your inputs are going to be increased, decreased, how your system will react to some driving input. Especially if you remember that any input that you can give to the system can be decomposed as a sum of harmonics using Fourier series. Okay. Right. So your, your input itself is also a sum of harmonics. So it's not strange to analyze harmonic response. Okay. I think with that, uh, we covered today's material. Remember, there is a code at the end of the uh, slides. Maybe I'll just send you the uh, the slides in the chat so you can uh, look at the code if you want. And uh, if I'll pause the recording, if you have questions, uh, you can ask. Okay.